Hello everyone and welcome to part one of a several part series on EKG basics. We're going to start with some basic EKG factoids and then we're going to get deeper and deeper into some good 12 lead interpretation and differentials. Um, I'm sure that uh, several of you are starting to recognize my voice by now, but if not, my name is Austin Kaiser. I'm the uh, clinical educator as well as a flight paramedic for PHI over in California. So let's look at what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be in this section in part one, we're really going to be focusing on EKG segments. Uh, in parts two and so on, we're going to be looking at abnormal rhythms. Uh, we're going to be looking at the cardiac axis to be able to uh, add that to our differential diagnosis in a 12 lead. Uh, we're going to look at STEMI and ACS, and then we're going to look at some STEMI equivalents like Scarbosa criteria. So the First thing that we think about when we're looking at a um, at an EKG is we have to think about the cardiac cycle. So we know that each uh, each cardiac cycle should have a P wave, a QRS complex, and then a T wave. So we should see those atria depolarizing with that big P wave, uh, really a little P wave. Uh, we should see. Uh, a little space between the P wave and the QRS complex, we call that our PR interval, and uh, that's where the AV node is holding on to that complex for uh, about 0.16 seconds, and then it sends that, uh, that signal down through the bundle of Hiss, and then the left and the right bundle branches, and then down to the Purkinje fibers, and we see that massive ventricular depolarization, and then we see a little bit of a segment of about uh, 0.2 seconds or so, where the ventricles are just sitting there in a squeezed state, and um, and then they start to relax and repolarize, and then we see that big T wave. And so we know that we generally will look for the P wave, the QRS complex, and then the T wave, but it's just as important to look at the space between those waves um, to look at our intervals and our segments because that tells us a lot about what we're looking at on this EKG. So the first thing we're going to look at is the segment. So the first thing is, is the PR interval. Um, we can see right here that the PR intervals from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the R wave and it should be less than five little boxes. So um, <clears throat> uh, each little box is 0.04 seconds and so if we have five little boxes then that is 0.2 seconds or one-fifth of a second uh, and that PR interval should be less than 0.2 seconds or less than five little boxes. If it's longer than that then we have a heart block, right? When we're looking at the PR interval what we're really looking at is we're looking at the AV node and how well it's functioning. So when the SA node fires and we see that big P wave because of that atrial depolarization, that um, signal gets uh, transmitted down to the AV node, and the AV node should hold on to it for about 0.12 to 0.16 seconds and uh, before sending it off to the ventricles. And so if the AV node is taking a really long time to get rid of the message because the AV node is a little weak, then we would see something like a first degree heart block. Or we could not see any type of PR interval, meaning that that heart <coughs> uh, has some sort of other block going on. So the next thing we look at is our QRS complex. Um, it should be narrow, and you can think of the QRS complex as what uh, streets did this heart use to depolarize the ventricles? So did they use surface streets where it takes forever to go anywhere, um, meaning that the QRS complex is going to be really wide because it took a really long time for those ventricles to depolarize? Or did it use the normal highway that it's supposed to, like the bundle of Hiss and the left and right bundle branches and then the Purkinje fibers? That, those are the big autobahn, the, the freeway um, that they can get from point A to point B also known as point Q to point S, very quickly. Um, so the QRS complex should be less than three little boxes, and if it's wider than that, then we have some sort of block, some disruption in the normal freeway. The, the Autobahn has a little construction, so that heart had to take a little surface streets, uh, and it took forever for those ventricles to depolarize. Um, the last thing that we look at is the QT interval, and that is the, the heart's ability to fully depolarize rest and then fully repolarize. Um, and when I say rest, I mean depolarize, fully squeeze and get as much ejection as possible and then repolarize. Um, and it should be occurring in less than 0.45 seconds. So if you have a longer QT interval, it's taking longer for that heart to repolarize, then um, there's going to be some medications that are going to be contraindicated in this patient. 
So let's look at it one more time. We see that we see the P wave um, means atrial depolarization. So we can see uh, this heart down below, this picture graphic down below that we see the SA node is firing and it's sending its impulse to both atria and down toward the AV node. And we see that P wave signifying atrial depolarization. We have that PR interval, meaning that the AV node has that signal and is holding on to it for about 0.16 seconds or so before sending it off to the rest of the ventricles. The AV node's pretty important, right? Because if you had the P waves uh, fire, or if you had the atria fire and then the ventricles immediately fire again, you wouldn't get a very good atrial kick and you'd be really battering those, uh, the bicuspid and the tricuspid valves um, from uh, both directions. So it's very important that the atria fire holds on for a, uh, for a split second, for about 0.16 seconds before the ventricles start to fire. So we have that PR interval, and then we have the QRS complex signifying that the ventricles are firing. We have the ventricles at full squeeze um, during that ST segment, and then the heart starts to relax and recover, and we see that little T wave. So when we're looking at a cardiac rhythm, there's a few things that we need to look for. We need to look at the rate, we need to look at the regularity, we need to look for the presence of P waves, and then we need to look for normal or abnormal intervals. So most of you probably know that if you have a heart rate less than 60, you are bradycardic. 60 to 100 is completely normal cardiac, and greater than 100 beats per minute is tachycardic. When you're looking at regularity, it can be regular, like a normal sinus rhythm in an elderly person. Um, <clears throat> I say elderly because a normal sinus rhythm in a young person does not look very regular oftentimes because we are so good at compensating that our heart rate slows down and speeds up very quickly. Um, so regular, meaning that they all march out perfectly. Is it regularly irregular? So it sounds like the, um, like the beat of a drum on a song where it's definitely not completely regular, but there's a tune that I can absolutely follow. So is it regularly irregular? I would start to think of a low level heart block. Uh, or is it irregularly irregular? Like there's no tune whatsoever. It's just a dubstep song. Uh, and we're looking at something like atrial or ventricular fibrillation. All right, so a few things. Uh, this course does assume that the, uh, the student listener right now does have a foundation in EKG identification. If you are third riding or preparing for third ride with PHI, I'm sure that you um, have done EKGs before. So this is really just focusing on abnormal EKG stuff. This is not to help you learn what a, uh, a normal sinus rhythm looks like, um, which I'm sure nobody needs help with that anyway. So the first thing we're going to look at is AFib. Uh, so AFib uh, is irregularly irregular. That's kind of the hallmark key. So there's no marching out of those QRS complexes. Um, <clears throat> uh, there's real no P waves. It just has that real artifactual um, baseline. Uh, and you, um, uh, you'll notice that uh, you'll never have a flat baseline. You'll typically have changing amplitudes of the QRS complex. Um, typically, your pulse ox waveform will also be um, pretty funky looking. It won't be normal looking. Uh, and that's just because the atria are beating anywhere from 300 to 600 beats per minute, and the ventricles are doing what the ventricles are doing, anywhere from uh, 50 beats per minute up to you know 180 or 200 beats per minute. <clears throat> Atrial flutter uh, can be any rate. Um, it's typically regular, but it can be regularly irregular. Um, so it can have <clears throat> like a two to one or a three to one uh, or a variable conduction, making it that regularly irregular. Uh, but it's the big thing you're looking for is just those shark tooth P waves um, uh, that are either hidden or very obvious in this, uh, in this EKG strip down below. All right, so <clears throat> Those were just the two simple um, irregular rhythms. In part two, we're going to be breaking down a lot more irregular rhythms uh, as far as heart blocks and bundle branch blocks and things like that. But this was just to really review the, uh, the cardiac uh, cycle and the waveforms and the segments. Uh, and we will see you on part two for uh, a lot more irregularity. All right, guys, thanks. Uh, like I said, if you or like I've said in, in other videos, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. My uh, email is akaiser at phiairmedical.com, and we'll see you guys for part two.